Hi everybody, welcome to our OU Lunch Break webinar, celebrating a healthier Purim in moderation. A look at heroes, villains, candy, and more. I'm Adina Sakloff of ParentingSimply.com. I do want to take a minute to thank Rebison Junie Steinig for putting this all together. I want to thank Alex Cook for handling the technical aspects of this webinar. I also want to give a shout out to Devorah Katz. I think I say this each time. She's in Alon Shvut, Israel. I am in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm so happy that we're able to continue working together. And it's only technology that has made this possible. Okay. So if you've never joined us for the lunch break webinar, this is how it works. First, I'm going to speak and then I hand it over to Devorah Katz. So Devorah is going to be speaking about how to have a healthier Purim, how to prevent meltdowns with young children, and how to really enhance your Purim Suda. She's really going to be focusing more on the younger kids. I am taking upon myself to talk about a little, a little bit of a heavier topic here and that is really how to protect our kids from unsafe behavior, how to teach kids to resist negative peer pressure, and how to really help children make good decisions, make good choices. So we are all, we're going to speak about how we can do this all year round and also how we can do this during Purim or before Purim or how do we prepare for Purim so that our kids are making good choices so that they can resist negative peer pressure, they can protect themselves from unsafe behavior. And unfortunately, we know in our community there's a lot of problems with drinking around Purim time, so we're going to talk specifically about that as well. All right, so let's get started. We all know that the most important thing about parenting is role modeling, or the most important aspect of parenting, the best way that we can really help our children to become responsible adults is to role model for them, role model for them responsibility. Any way we want to teach our values to our kids, we need to role model those values. They need to see us acting in the way that we want them to act. Kids do as we do. They don't do as we say. They don't listen to lectures or anything like that. They really learn by example. We could see this even in the Purim story with Mordechai. Mordechai is courageous. He's brave. He sticks to his values at all costs. And really, Esther does this, does the same thing. She sticks to her values. She's brave. She's courageous. She had a role model. Mordechai was her role model. She lived in his home. She grew up in his home. And we can emulate this as well. We can be role models for our kids. We need to be role models for our kids. And we specifically need to be role models um, for our children when they have to deal with unsafe behaviors, like drinking. Okay. So I looked through the literature and on alcohol and uh, alcohol abuse and alcoholism and of course I went to the web and you could see the I put the um, link to the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism on your handout okay so they also agree that role modeling is the best way to teach your kids how to avoid unsafe behaviors or how to avoid engaging in unsafe behavior. So they say, you could just, it's on your page, that you should use alcohol moderately. Don't communicate to your child that alcohol is a good way to handle problems. For example, don't come home from work and say, I had a rotten day, I need a drink. 
Let your children see that you have other healthier ways to cope with stress, such as exercise, listening to music, or talking things over with your spouse or friend. Don't tell your kids stories about um, your own drinking that conveys that message that alcohol use is funny or glamorous. Understand that the media and peers portray alcohol in glamorous ways. So that's, we all know that when you watch TV and you see these commercials on TV, it sounds like alcohol is all fun and games, right? Uh, never drink and drive or ride in a car with a, uh, with a driver who has been drinking. When you entertain other adults, serve alcohol-free beverages and plenty of food. If anyone drinks too much at your party, make arrangements for them to get home safely. So those are very common sense things that we need to do as adults so that our kids can learn how to deal with alcohol in an appropriate, in appropriate ways, in healthy ways, okay? So a lot of parents will say, well, that's great. You know, I don't drink. Um, and we're not even specifically talking about drinking, but I have good values. I act responsibly. You know, I'm a good person, but my child is not showing that type of behavior. They're a teen and they, they're not acting like a mensch. Okay, I role model all these things and they're not acting in that way. They're not acting in ways that I think are appropriate. So you should not worry. Michael C. Bradley in his book, Yes, Your Teen is Crazy. It's a great book. Cute name. Great book. He says, he assures parents, this is on your handout, he assures parents that your morals, values, and ethics become an integral part of your child's psychological makeup if you have been imparting good values to your children, they will stay with him for the rest of his life. During adolescence, they may have put them, your values, in cold storage, but they're there and they will reappear, reappear in time. So don't get nervous. Your kids are seeing good values and they're taking it all in. And hopefully it will, as they grow up to adulthood, they start turning 18, 19, 20, 21, you will see that they really did take those lessons to heart and they will start acting in those ways. Okay, so that's really the first thing that we want to do is really role model appropriate behavior. We want to set the stage for appropriate good, um, good behavior. We want to do this. Uh, with regards to alcohol, but we also want to do this with anything that we're trying to teach our children. Okay, children are born with good midot. They need to learn how to develop good midot and where that where their teachers. Parents are their teachers. Okay, so the second thing that we need to do is really develop a loving and open relationship with our kids so that they want us to be their role model. They'll want to connect with us. They'll want to have us as a role model. Okay, we want to make sure that we have open communication patterns with our children. So I had a client who came to me and said, you know, I'm so upset. My son, he called me and told me that he tried smoking. And I don't know what to do. I said, wait, I said, let's just Stop right here. You had me at hello. He called you to tell you that he tried smoking. So she said, yes. I said, that's incredible. I said, you have this open communication with your kid that he came and he actually told you, he admitted to you that he was engaging in an unsafe behavior, um, something that you don't approve of. He came and he told you that? She said, yeah. I said, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing right that he felt comfortable coming to tell you that? And she actually said, well, you know, I actually had um, some serious health issues and I really, I spoke to a lot of therapists and I spoke to um, a few friends that were in the field and I really got some very good advice on how to present it to my kids and how to talk to my kids about it and we really developed very good communication patterns because of that and we developed very open communication because of that I, i'm just I'm very open with my kids and i really try to i'm a straight shooter and i really try to tell them 
things in, uh, in a way that they can understand. I thought that this was incredible. So again, this is really what we want to strive for. We want to strive for this open communication. We want to make sure that if our kids are making mistakes, they're going to come and tell us. Not that they're totally going to avoid any unsafe behaviors, but that they feel comfortable coming to us, telling us about it. Um, and then we could help them find a way out. Okay, Because that's really what her son was telling her. He was calling her to say, I'm in a little too deep. I need help. I don't want to go down this, this, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want, I don't want to end up being a smoker. So that, that again, that is really what he was trying to tell her. And that's really, again, what we want to strive for. All right. Now, what really holds us back from having a good relationship with our teen? So there's a few things. Number one, Rabbi Niven, who is a life coach, he says that teens or even preteens exude this attitude of you can't make me, you can't tell me what to do. And it's very normal. Okay, this is really the ticker tape in their brain. You can't make me, you can't tell me what to do. And anytime we say anything to them, we are coming up against that ticker tape. We are coming up against that brick wall of you can't make me, you can't tell me what to do. And it's very normal. Kids are trying to, especially teens, are trying to individuate. They're trying to become more independent. They're trying to develop autonomy. They're trying to develop a sense of self. And they need to move away from us. And they need to not listen to us. Right? And again, there are, more, there are teens who are more independent than other teens who feel this strongly, who have a very loud ticker tape of you can't make me, you can't tell me what to do going on through their brains. And of course, we're going to have a harder time with them. And there's some teens that are more laid back. But at every point, a child really needs to break away from their parents and find their own path. Okay, so that's very hard for parents to deal with. It's very hard to talk to a person who's always thinking you can't make me and you can't tell me what to do. Another thing that parents have issues with is the fact that teens always think that they are right, or preteens, they think they're right. And they'll say, oh, what's the big deal about drinking? It's so not a big deal, or what's the big deal if I wear this? Why do you care so much? And again, they're saying, I'm right, you're wrong, or my friends are right, you're wrong, I don't have to listen to you. Again, it's very frustrating to have to talk to somebody who has these attitudes. All right, especially since we know we have all this life experience, we know that we're right, and usually they're wrong. So it's very difficult for parents to create this open, to create or to maintain this open, loving relationship with their preteens, teens. Um, even some children are, are like this. So what can we do? So Jim Fay, in his um, book, Love and Logic, or his philosophy, love, he calls it Love and Logic, he says that we can agree to disagree. Okay. So he says, when a child comes to you and say, says, what's the big deal about my drinking? You want to say something like, oh, I'm glad that you told me what you think, that you think drinking is not a big deal. I'm glad to hear your opinion on that. I don't agree with it. I think that drinking is a big deal. I think it's illegal under 21, but I'm glad to hear your opinion. I, I'm assuming that that's, most teens feel the same way that you feel, okay? So now you're agreeing to disagree. You've just got your message in, in a very clever and diplomatic way in a way that a, your child could hear you. You are bypassing that message of, you can't make me, you can't tell me what to do, because you haven't told them to do anything. You've just stated your opinion. You've bypassed that uh, ticker tape of, I'm right and you're wrong, because you're telling them, basically, 
that they're right. You're not really telling them that they're right, but you are you are respecting their opinion, so you are bypassing that in that way, but you're still getting your message across. I think that um, drinking is is wrong, and I think that it is legal under 21. Okay, and that's a very powerful way. It seems like it's not a powerful way to get your message across, but it's a very powerful way, again, a very diplomatic, a very clever way of getting your message across. It's really the only way that our teens can hear us. Okay, not through lectures. Kids don't listen to lectures. Teens don't listen to lectures. They just tune you out. But this, in agreeing to disagree, they can hear you. All right. Another thing that we can do, which is similar, uh, in the book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, there's a story about a father whose son wanted to go to a rated R movie. His son was 17 years old, and the father really didn't want him to go. And he told his son that he didn't want him to go, and the son said, well, you really can't stop me. You know, I'm 17. I can really just sneak. And the father said, you know what, you're right. You can sneak. I really can't stop you. But the only thing that I could say to you is this. I don't like the messages, the subliminal messages in Hollywood movies. I don't like what they say about women. I don't like what they say about relationships. And I don't like what they say about violence. So the only thing I could ask you is that if you do go to this movie that you think, is this really the way people should be talking to each other? Is this violence really appropriate? Um, is this the way we really should treat women? Are women being objectified? So I just, just I want you to think about those questions, okay? And leave it at that. That's actually even a little bit longer lecture than you might want to even give. Um, it's not really a lecture. It's a clever, it's just a clever way to agree to disagree so that they could hear that message. And hopefully he won't go to the movie. But if he does go to the movie, then he knows, hopefully in his mind, he's asking those questions. Like, what is the subliminal Hollywood message here? Okay, is this appropriate? Does this fit in with my family's values? Okay, another thing that you can do, and this is really if you have a very good relationship with your child, is you can let them know that you would be disappointed. So the father could have said to his son, you could go to the movie, but just know I would be disappointed if you did that. Okay? And again, leave it at that, just one line, okay? Just let them know that you would be disappointed. But that's really only if you have a good relationship with your kid. Now, another thing that we want to do is we want to take little opportunities to talk um, and really ask our kids' opinion. And this we want to do all year round. Now, we're talking specifically about Purim. We don't want to just do this around Purim time. We want to really talk about unsafe behaviors all the time. Okay. Um, so this is from How to Talk So Kids Will Listen. And basically, they say... Again, don't give one big lecture and think, whew, I'm done. I talked about drugs. I talked about drinking. No, it's, it's constant. We need to constantly be talking about it, again, in very clever ways. So they say, and how to talk to kids will listen, they say, if um, you're reading the newspaper and you see an article, I don't know, on the effects of drinking on, on the brain, okay? So show it to your kids. Have a discussion. What do you think? This is like really interesting information here. Wow, did you know that you know drinking could do that to your to your brain? Okay, again, not see why you shouldn't drink. This is why you shouldn't drink. You should. Um, you don't know what drinking does to your brain. I've told you a million times. This is why you shouldn't drink. No, you're just having a conversation. This is so interesting. Wow, look at what researchers are finding out. Okay, let's say you're watching TV with your kids um, and you see a kid making a bad decision or you see a kid who's not able to resist negative peer pressure. You could say, oh boy, I feel bad for that kid. He's really making some bad decisions there. You know, what do you think he could do instead? Okay, again, we're opening up the conversation. We're having some 
open communication type moments. Right? And really don't even expect your kids to answer you back. They might not have any ideas, but you're really just, um, you're, it's just a springboard for conversation. And even if it's not, even if they're not going to answer you, you're getting them to start thinking about these things. And you're also inserting your values in there. Right? You're saying, oh, that person is not able to resist negative peer pressure. Your child's thinking, oh, that's something I need to think about. How do I resist negative peer pressure? Okay? It's all unconscious. It might not even be conscious, but you are getting them to start thinking about these important issues. Okay. Also, if you see somebody in person who's smoking, say, oh boy, that's, I feel bad for that person. I'm so glad I never started smoking. It's so hard to stop smoking. So I'm glad I never got started with that. It's just, it does terrible things to your lungs and it causes cancer. I'm glad. I really feel bad for him. Okay, so again, we're just um, using little opportunities to tell them how they, we feel about unsafe behavior and giving them little ways, little ideas on how to, um, how to think about these things. Okay. We could also ask in a non-confrontational way, like, you know, what do your friends say about drugs and drinking? You know, what are some of the issues in school? You know, what, what's going on in school with all this type of stuff? Again, don't expect them to answer. Just expect them to start thinking. Okay. Um, I just want to, I think we touched on this, but I just want to say it again. We really want to use I statements to really, when we're talking to our kids about these things, about unsafe behaviors. So again, instead of saying, you better never act like that, you better toe the line when it comes to drinking, you want to say things like, you know, I, I don't like to read about kids drinking themselves sick. Um, I get upset when kids use drinking to feel cool. I wish they could find other things to do that would help them feel good about themselves. Okay, I statements. Talk about yourself. No accusatory language. All right, another thing that we need to do is we really need to be their safety net. We want to tell our kids if they're ever in trouble, they could call us. Okay, and you will pick them up from wherever they are without any questions asked. You will not get angry at them. You will not scold them. You will come and get them. Okay, kids need an easy out. They need to be able to call their parents if they're in, un in an unsafe place. You can also add, if you can't get in touch with me or if you don't feel comfortable calling me, these are the people that you could call. These are the family members that you could call, and these are our friends that you could call. Please, you know, take advantage of that if you need us. And this must be said before Purim. It's so important to sit down with your kids and let them know that they could call you at any time. All right. Another thing that we could do is we can roll play with our kids. I'm sorry, before we get to that, if there is a history of substance abuse um, or any type of history of alcoholism, your child needs to know that and you need to have that conversation with them. Okay, the next thing that we could do is role playing. There's a woman, I gave you the link, it should be on your handout. Um, her name is Glennon and she has this website this blog called Momastery.com. And she said on her blog that we always say to our kids, just say no to drugs. And she realized that she really has a hard time saying no. People ask her things and she wants to say no. And she says yes, not even about the big things, just about the little things in life. She said it's very hard to say no. So she decided to sit down with her son and to really come up with some the th some things that he could say if he is ever in a difficult situation. Some uh, ways that he could say no in a nice way, in a cool way, if he ever found himself um, in a situation where he was having trouble resisting peer pressure, where and where there was 
unsafe behavior. So these are some of the um, things that she came up with. So, oh, well, she came up with this with her son. So when you notice a lonely kid, you could say, hey, there's a seat for you. Come and join us. When someone offers you a beer, they decided that he would say, no, thanks. I'm allergic to alcohol. Totally blows. When um, someone starts texting while driving, they could say, hey, just saw a movie about a kid who got killed because he was testing, texting and driving. I don't want you to get killed because I plan to ask you for many, many rides in the future. Pull over if you need to text. I'm not in a hurry. Um, another example, a kid is being teased by another kid in the hallway. Hey, I don't want anybody to get in trouble here. Why don't you follow me out of here? I'll walk you to class. Um, another one is if someone is about to drink and drive, they came up with, don't risk it, man. My dad will get us home. No questions asked. He'd rather pick us up here than in jail. So again, that was a great activity to do with her child, and it's a great activity for us to do with our children, to really help them have the language that they need to say no in difficult situations. Okay, now let's say you don't have a good relationship with your child, and you don't have an open, open communication with your child, then the best thing to do is to find a mentor. In uh, Brooks and Goldstein book, called Raising Resilient Children, um, they recommend finding children mentors in order to help them build resilience. So kids who come from difficult homes or kids who have difficult relationships with their parents, they have found that if that child has a mentor, has someone that cares for them, has, somebody to look, has someone to look out for them, if this child has someone to talk to, they will be more resilient and they'll be able to overcome their challenges in life and really become emotionally healthy adults. So you can find a Rebbe, you can find an older uh, child, uh, an, you know, an older sibling, an older kid in the neighborhood. You want to, of course, do background checks, um, but really try to avail yourself of some of the people in your neighborhood that could be a mentor for your child. That could be extremely helpful. Okay. So now, lastly, we really want to talk about helping kids make good choices. And this is really important to do all the time, not just when they're teens, but really teaching kids to make decisions and make good choices. So Becky Bailey, I, it's on your sheet, she said in her book, Easy to Love, Difficult to Discipline, she says most people make their choices unconsciously and feel controlled by life. If you raise your children with awareness of his choices, he will not only feel less controlled, he really will have a greater command of himself both psychologically and physiologically, okay? So it's very important to teach our kids to make choices. We don't understand how many choices we do make in a day. And especially modern, in modern day times, times that we live in, we are constantly making choices, more so than in previous generations. And we need confidence in doing that, and we need practice in doing that. Okay, so choices, the benefits of choices, let's talk a little bit more about the benefits of choices. They help kids cooperate. Um, it helps them practice making decisions. It teaches them independent thinking. It's uh, a respectful way to communicate with our kids. When we give them choices, it's very respectful. Again, we're bypassing, when we do give choices, we're bypassing that ticker tape in our teen's brain, in our preteen's brain of you can't make me, you can't tell me what to do, I'm always right. Um, it stops power struggles for that reason. It, and it allows parents to maintain authority in a kind and loving way. Again. Or because that reason, because of that reason, because it's a very clever and diplomatic way to speak to our kids. Okay. So here we have some examples on your handout. We have some examples of um, 
of decisions or giving of choices that we can give our children. So let's just go over it. Um, when kids are little, you could say you can jump or hop into the car. You can use the blue or green cup. Do you want to put your pants or your shirt on first? Um, to encourage a feeling of autonomy, would you like a sandwich or pizza for lunch? Do you want to make the sandwich or should I? Would you like to ride your bike or take a walk over to the park? To encourage involvement in making rules, you could say when is a good time for you to set the table? Would you like to say excuse me or pardon me when you leave the dinner table? What is a good amount of time? for computer use for kids, okay, get them involved in the rulemaking, to encourage kids to take care of themselves. We wanna say, do you wanna take a bath or a shower? Do you wanna use bar soap or baby soap? Do you wanna get a blue or green toothbrush? To encourage decision-making, we could say, do you like blue, blue or clear bowl? Do you think grandma would like flowers or a gift card for her birthday? What should we make for dinner, chicken or noodles? So those are just many examples of how we could give kids choices, help them get involved in, in making decisions and decision making. As they get older, and even when they're younger, we could say this to them. Uh, let's say you need help around the house. You could say there's some yard work that needs to get done. When are you available? What will work for you? What do you think? What should we do first or second? Should we rake the leaves? Should we bring in the, the lawn furniture? Okay, or when you're having another example of when you're having guests for Shabbos, could say, you know, we're having some guests for Shabbos, some baking needs to be done. When are you available? Uh, what time will you be available? What time works for you? Um, when will you be, I'm sorry, when will you be available to help? What time works for you? Okay, what do you think we should make? Do you have any ideas of what our guests would like for a dessert? Okay, and we also, we want to positively reinforce their decision to make decision making because it's not easy to make decisions so we want to say well you know I'm glad we decided to make brownies for Shabbos lunch it was a great decision the guests love them okay uh, or that was a good decision to hop into the car it keeps our leg muscles strong we got into the car in a fun way so positively enforce the fact that they were able to make decisions that they were able to make choices all right now Let's talk specifically about Purim, okay? Um, and we could use some of this language that we just discussed about choices. So you want to sit your child down two weeks before Purim, a week before Purim, and say, you know, Purim's coming up. A lot of people, a lot of your friends are going to be drinking. You know, how are you planning on handling all of this? Um, what what's going to work for you you know what do you think would work for you do you have any ideas on what you could do if you find yourself in an unsafe situation okay remind them also that you're available to pick them up from any place no questions asked whatever time it is um, and you know ask questions like you know what do you think parents should do around perm time to help kids feel safe, to help kids act safe? Or, you know, as a teen going through this, what, what rules do you think should be in place for drinking? Okay, is there anything that you did when you were uncomfortable that sort of helped you? So those are some very good questions that we could ask our kids to help them make good decisions and to help them resist peer pressure on, on Purim, okay? So, I think that's basically it for today. I think we've covered all we need to on how to help our children, how to protect our children from unsafe behavior, how to help them resist peer pressure, and um, how to help them make good choices. Really, how to create a loving, warm um, relationship with our kids and how to help our kids, really help, how to help us develop an open communication, open communication patterns with our children, really talk, we, and also about role modeling for our kids, how to behave. So I hope you enjoyed, and uh, have a wonderful, happy, and healthy Purim. Okay, and now it is Deborah's turn. Act. Kids do as we do. They don't do as we say. They don't listen to lectures or anything like that. They really learn by example. We could see this even in the Purim story with Mordechai. 
Mordechai is courageous. He's brave. He sticks to his values at all costs. And really, Esther does this does the same thing. She sticks to her values. She's brave. She's courageous. She had a role model. Mordechai was her role model. She lived in his home. She grew up in his home. And we can emulate this as well. We can be role models for our kids. We need to be role models for our kids. And we specifically need to be role models um, for our children when they have to deal with un during Purim or before Purim or how do we prepare for Purim so that our kids are making good choices so that they can resist negative peer pressure they can protect themselves from unsafe behavior and unfortunately we know in our community there's a lot of problems with drinking around Purim time so we're going to talk specifically about that as well all right so let's get started we all know that the most important thing about parenting is role modeling or the most important aspect of parenting the best way that we can really help our children to become responsible adults is to role model for them role model for them responsibility any way we want to teach our values to our kids we need to role model those values they need to see us acting in the way that we want them to act safe behaviors like drinking okay so I looked through the literature and on alcohol and uh, alcohol abuse and alcoholism and of course I went to the web and you could see the I put the um, link to the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism on your handout. Okay, so they also agree that role modeling is the best way to teach your kids how to avoid unsafe behaviors or how to avoid engaging in unsafe behavior. So they say, you could just, it's on your page that you should use alcohol moderately to Devorah cats. So Devorah is going to be speaking about how to have a healthier Purim, how to prevent meltdowns with young children, and how to really enhance your Purim Suda. She's really going to be focusing more on the younger kids. I am taking upon myself to talk about a little, a little bit of a heavier topic here and that is really how to protect our kids from unsafe behavior how to teach kids to resist negative peer pressure and how to really help children make good decisions make good choices so we are all we're going to speak about how we can do this all year round and also how we can do this hi everybody welcome to our OU lunch break webinar celebrating a healthier perm in moderation a look at heroes villains candy and more I'm Adina Sakloff of ParentingSimply.com I do want to take a minute to thank Rebison Juni Steinig for putting this all together. I want to thank Alex Cook for handling the technical aspects of this webinar. I also want to give a shout out to Devorah Katz. I think I say this each time. She's in Alon Shvut, Israel. I am in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm so happy that we're able to continue working together. And it's only technology that has made this possible. Okay. So if you've never joined us for the lunch break webinar, this is how it works. First, I'm going to speak and then I hand it over to